No, you can take that. There are two passages of Scripture that we're going to read here today, and we're going to read one now, we're going to read the other one later. The first one is in the book of Psalms. It's Psalm number 90. Psalm 90. So I invite you please to take out the Bible that you brought or the one that is in the seat in front of you or the app on your phone or iPad or whatever it is that you bring and open up Psalm 90. If you're using a physical book, if you split it right down the middle and open up in the middle, you'll probably hit the Psalms and if not, go a little bit to the left and you will. The Psalms are the hymnal, so to speak, of ancient Israel and this one in its original form, and, and what we have here in the Psalms uh, may be adjusted somewhat over time uh, so that people could understand it, um, but, but it is, at its, at its origin, is probably the oldest one, and that's Psalm 90. And so we're going to read Psalm 90, and I encourage you to follow along with me as I read. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by, ev by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The last line of this psalm has been striking to me for a long time, for many years. Establish the work of our hands. It's, it, it's so important that it's actually repeated twice as the conclusion to this prayer by Moses. It, it's really hit me and been important to me because, perhaps like you, I've had times where I've worked really hard on things and then wondered when I finished, is that really permanent? After all the work that I put into this, is it really going to last? And if so, how long? When I was in seminary um, back 15 years ago, let's say, uh, I got a job, a part-time job for about a year in the distance learning office at my seminary. And they had a database that was used to keep the records of all of the students that, um, that, that took part in the seminary from uh, far away and used the distance learning courses from the, that the seminary provided to get a start on their education. And so uh, I was involved in using this database, and I found pretty quickly that it didn't make a lot of sense, and it was really pretty poorly put together in certain ways, and there were things that we needed to keep track of that weren't there. So with my supervisors, with my boss's um, blessing, I went about learning how this um, fairly simple uh, database program worked and then how I could change and build up this database to accommodate all the different information that we had and as, in the course of doing that I learned that there were all these different things that I could do with it to automate it or to make it um, user-friendly that 
uh, I was not aware of before, and so I created all these, all these scripts, all these things that if you press this part here, then it does this thing over there, and, and it, was, it was a major, major endeavor. It, it became this project that was far bigger than anything that I was aware of, and when I was done, I was very proud of this, and uh, we started using it in the office, and it proved to be very helpful, but it wasn't too long after that that uh, I left that job and got another job doing something else. And soon after I left, it became apparent that what I had learned about this software application and then what I was doing with it was actually stuff that nobody remaining in the seminary, including people in IT, in information technology, who were supposed to be supporting this application, understood. And so therefore, when something went wrong with it, there was nobody there who knew how to fix it. And this was a, a, a frustration to me, and it was a, a sad thing for me, because I learned at that point, at you know probably about the age of 24, that you could work really hard on something and make something just perfect. But if it doesn't work for people, then it's useless. And, uh, and, and, there was, and it was too late. There, there was no way I could go back and train people how to do this. I was already moved on and doing something else. By the way, I did find out later, um, actually just this past year when I graduated with my doctorate from the same, same seminary, that the database did prove, at least in the eyes of my supervisor, who's still there, to have been worth it. But at the time, I, I really wondered, and even so, it may have been worth it, and it may still be worth it now, but it's got to be pretty old and antiquated now, and so all of that work that I did as software changes, as technology changes, has got to be wiped away. It's got to go away. I went from that to, at different times, working some temp jobs. And by definition, when you're working a temp job, you know that what you're doing is not going to last for very long because you're not going to last for very long. And uh, I worked different jobs where I would, you know, feel like one extremely tiny and easily replaceable and fairly insignificant part of a very large machine at, at a variety of different places. I also worked part-time uh, delivering pizzas. And delivering pizzas had its own certain reward in that I was able to listen to audiobooks while I was doing it, and I actually enjoyed that very much. And so that proved to be something of more lasting value to myself. But the thing about food service is that once you've delivered a pizza once, it's not like you're now done with your job because there are still hungry people and you're going to have to do it all, all again some other time. And then in 2004, I became the pastor of the first church that I became pastor of. Uh, in northern New Jersey, and this was a situation where the church had been in decline since the Kennedy administration. This is not an exaggeration. That is literal fact. Actually, it had been in decline probably since the New Deal, but it had a sort of surge, you know, a resurgence to sort of stem the tide and give it a new lease on life during the Kennedy administration. And, um, and, and so during that time, uh, that I was in this church with, you know, about, you know, 25 to 30 people on a Sunday morning. Um, the median age was about 73 years old. And um, they were virtually all white folks in a city that was two-thirds um, first or second generation Latin American immigrants. You know, it, it, was, it was, you know, a crumbling building and everything and, and a lot of uh, turmoil and and um, trauma and pain from some previous pastors. It was, it was a lot of work that I did. Um, and it was just me, you know. It was, it was me operating on my own. Um, and I wouldn't go so far as to say it was rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. It was more like rearranging deck chairs and repainting and uh, patching some holes and flooding the boiler system and coming up with a new menu for, you know, the, uh, the, the ballroom and, uh, and, you know, doing a whole lot of other stuff, but it was still the Titanic. <laughs> and, and so when I left after, after three years, it, it really made me wonder, you know, what, what was this for? You know, I mean, I learned a lot. I got a lot out of the experience. Um, what was it for for them? Is this going to last? Is this going to last beyond what I did? So, and, and then even through all of that, I used to think that no matter what I might be doing in my jobs, that at least my intellectual output was permanent. You know, at least, 
All the papers that I wrote were on the computer. All the thoughts that I had that I got down in writing were on the computer. All the sermons that I'd prepared notes for were on there. All of the, the, the work in studying the Bible, you know, written in the notes, you know, on the margins of my fallen apart Bible that I've had for the last 19 years. You know, all these, all these different things. And then going through uh, my doctorate and the, and the work that I, I put into my thesis. And, you know, now I'm trying to get it published and trying to get it between covers and, and all of this and, and thinking, well, at least, at least that'll be there. You know, at least after I die, at least there can be, you know, whatever the storage device is of the future, um, that my kids will have all this digitally and this will live on after I'm gone and that'll be very helpful, helpful for my biographer someday. And... Um, Okay, yeah, you're not laughing because you know how true my ego is. But, but, but I, you know, I, I now realize as I've gotten older that um, I strongly doubt that, that any of that intellectual output is permanent in any meaningful way. I, I now realize that my kids are not going to want to read every word that I've ever written. Um, that, that they're going to have much more important things to do and, and other things that are grabbing their time. Other than that, uh, I now realize that that my uh, my that my biographer um, has not been born yet and probably never will be, and and that and that this stuff is its value of my intellectual output is for the people that I share it with now, and, and maybe there might be some value in the future, but but that's basically it, and that if. As, as my terror has been the, you know, that, that all the storage devices, you know, the computer and the backup drive and everything is consumed in flames, that that, that would be grievous to me, but honestly, I, I would just keep moving on and keep doing stuff and probably wouldn't have lost nearly as much as I think. And so, in the middle of all that, maybe, maybe you can relate. You wonder, of, of all the stuff I've done, of all the stuff I've built, of all the stuff I've fixed, of all the service I've performed, of all the stuff I've created, of all the, all the energy I've invested, is the work of my hands really established? Is it really permanent? Is it really lasting? Is it really going to extend beyond my own lifetime, or for that matter, beyond this decade? You and I can get confidence that God will establish the work of our hands. That He will truly establish the work of our hands. That's the prayer that Moses prayed, and we can have confidence that the answer to that prayer is yes. But to understand how, we need to take a look at this whole psalm from the beginning, because it takes a very unexpected route to get to that hope. It starts in verse 1, where Moses says, Lord, You have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And that word dwelling place, in other translations, you'll see the word refuge. It's a word that, that literally refers to the den of an animal. You know, a burrowing animal or something that has a concealed hiding place in a burrow in the ground or in a crack in some ruins or something like this, in a hole in the wall. That's what the Lord our God has been for the people of God as long as there's been a people. He's been a concealed dwelling. He's been a place to rest, a place to live that is safe, that is secure from attack. And that is a, a beautiful verse. It's a great verse to memorize. It's a great verse to write on a card and put it on your refrigerator to remind yourself of that. He's been our dwelling place, our lair our concealed place throughout all generations. For as long as there's been a people of God, that's what God has been for His people. And then the very next verse says, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is God from forever past to forever future. He's God before the beginning of anything else. And if everything ended, if he chose for that to happen, he would still be God after that. There, he is beyond time. He is outside it. There, there is no time that God did not exist. God is God because he is. And this is good news for us because that means that he's a permanent sanctuary. He really is a sanctuary through all generations. 
He's permanent. He's lasting. He doesn't go away. We don't need to make a plan B, make a contingency for what's going to happen when the Lord our God ceases to be our refuge to find another one because He's permanent. He's eternal. But this is also bad news for us. Why? Why is it bad news? Because God is inconceivably greater than we are. And because of that, we cannot resist Him. God is inconceivably greater than we are. So we cannot resist Him, which means that we cannot avoid dying. We cannot avoid dying. We don't think much about death in our culture. We try to avoid it. We live in a technological age, in, a, in an industrial age, in an age with much division of labor, including division of humans, that puts death and dying out of the range, out of the sight of many of us. But it is all around. It's a phenomenon that I think for the average American happens to someone else. It happens to those people who live far away that we see on the news. Those people who live in a violent neighborhood that we don't live in. Or who live in a violent part of the world that we don't live in. It especially, death is actually extremely common in our culture and in our sight as it happens to fictional people. I mean, I, I was just trying to reflect in the last week in my entertainment, which has been small. I mean, I, I don't have a lot of time that I, that I take, that I, that I possess to watch TV or watch movies. But I have s- done some a little bit this week. And, and I can basically think of maybe two episodes of one show, one of another, and one movie that I saw this week. And I probably saw at least, at least a dozen slayings in that maybe four hours of entertainment, right? I, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine how many killings Hollywood style I have seen in the course of my life. So death is something that, that we're very familiar with as it happens to fictional people. And when we do think about it, we tend to think about it, I think even Christians tend to think about death according to the assumptions of the people who are the furthest away from our faith. Namely, that death is a natural phenomenon, that it is simply a part of life, and that therefore because death is just something that happens by virtue of being physical, by virtue of humans being humans, humans being animal in, in our biological nature, that therefore no one is responsible for it. It's, it's just what happens. It's just a thing that occurs. There is no why. It's just what it is. We don't, we don't believe this when, we, when, we, when it registers in our minds, when we're consciously talking about it. But I think that's very often how we approach life and death. But the Bible describes death as someone's responsibility. Always. It desp- describes death as someone's responsibility. In fact, the Bible describes death as if a bunch of different people are, are, are responsible for it. So, for example, if relevant to the case, a killer might be responsible for someone's death. That's easy enough to recognize. We would agree with that, too. But, even whether a person dies violently at someone else's hands or not, dies naturally, the Bible says that the person who dies is responsible for their own death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul writes, The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The wrong things that people do result in death. You know, it's like you work the the whole work week of your life doing sin, doing things that are against God, doing things that are selfish, doing things that are morally wrong, and at the end of the week, you get your paycheck, and your paycheck is death. And so the person who dies is responsible. In in the book of Ezekiel, God says the soul who sins will die. Period. It's what it is. The soul who sins will die. Every person dies because every person does wrong. Sins. But the Bible also describes, holds responsible for death, Adam. The first person, the first human being, the first man. Because he also is the one who committed 
the first sin along with his wife Eve, but Adam is the one who for our whole human race is held responsible for it. Paul also writes in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 12, through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So the reason that you sin, the reason that I sin, the reason that we have a bent within us to do something wrong, to, to violate God's will, and keep in mind that God's will primarily, fundamentally, is that we treat God like God. And so anytime we treat ourselves like God, then we're violating God's will. Anytime we're relying on our own wisdom rather than his, anytime we're doing things our way rather than his way, anytime we're prioritizing self over him, which happens as easily and naturally as breathing, all of that tendency that we have, we got from our ancestor Adam. So we die because we sin, but we sin because he sinned. Death entered the world because of him. So Adam is responsible for death as well. But it's not just Adam because the Bible goes further to say that the devil, Satan, this evil angel, this, this evil force is also responsible for death because he is the one who tempted our first parents, Adam and Eve, to sin in the first place. He was the one, before there were any humans who were living for themselves, he was an angel who lived for himself and fell. And to spite God, to hurt God, to, to break God's heart, and to set up his own realm and his own kingdom, he convinced human beings created in the image of God to do things his way. And we did. In the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, a letter to this group of Jewish Christians, chapter 2, verse 14, it, sa- it refers to the devil as him who had the power of death. The devil is the one who had the power of death. He tried to get, successfully, tried to get human beings to die. And not only that, but, but apart from the limitation of God on what the devil can do, the devil is capable of killing any one of us. He's a spiritual force of incredible power. And he is able to take people's lives, and he does so, except when prevented by God. So the Bible describes the person who dies as responsible for their own death, Adam as responsible for that person's death, the devil as responsible for that person's death, but finally, the Bible describes God as responsible for that person's death. Yes, God as responsible for the death of every person who dies. Because sin is intolerable. That's why the wages of sin is death. Sin is intolerable. It cannot be tolerated. It cannot be put up with. God is is an eternal and infinite God, and so therefore, He's been putting up with it from us for a few thousand years now. To us, that seems like a long time. To him, not so much. To him, it's an eye blink. It's not a real big deal. The Apostle Peter writes that in God's sight, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Time, as we, as we measure it, has no meaning to God. It, it, it's not pertinent to him. And so he's put up with sin for several thousand years, but, but to him, that's a short time between our fault, our failure, our offense, and him sweeping it away. Sweeping that imperfection away. God must deal death to sin because sin, the rejection of perfection, is intolerable. The rejection of goodness is intolerable. God is goodness. And so the rejection of God is the rejection of good, which is evil. And God is good, and because he's good, he cannot allow evil to abide. Therefore, he cannot, cannot allow evildoers to abide either. And that's what Moses describes here in Psalm 90. He's describing a reality that God, in his fierce fury against evil, against wrong, against injustice against unrighteousness is absolutely irresistible we can't stop it 
We can't stop it from happening. We can't stop our lives ending at 70 or 80 years as he describes here for his own lifetime or 90 or 100 as we might say in our day of medical technology. We can slow it down, we can put it off, but we can't stop it. We can't prevent it. As, as he says in verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to escape. This is what is coming to us. But this is, and wisdom lies in recognizing and accepting this. In verse 12, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom, the Bible says, is the fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is recognizing our tininess compared to his hugeness and recognizing what is due us in light of our wickedness and his glory and holiness. But. That's a long way from where we started in verse 1. You've been our refuge. You've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. What kind of dwelling is that? What kind of dwelling is this? How is God our dwelling if he kills us off? Without exception. Every single person. Every single day. Well, Moses reasons that there must be more to God than this. There must be more to God than this. It just doesn't make sense. You know, think about all that God had done for his people, starting with their ancestor Abraham. He chose this man in about 2000 BC. This man who didn't know him, who worshiped idols, and he chose this man to be blessed, to be blessed, to bless him with wealth to bless him with a promise of posterity. He didn't have kids. God said, I'm going to miraculously give you kids. You know, and, and at the age of, of Abraham being 100 and Sarah being 90, gives birth to a son. I mean, incredible to keep the line going. And the same thing with Isaac and Jacob says, I'm going to give you this land, this land where other people are living. It's going to be yours. You're going to be the father of nations. There are going to be kings who are descended from you. And then, and then these people, you know, the, uh, his, his grandson Jacob, who God renames Israel, takes care of him. And, and Israel has 12 sons. And, and there's conflict in the family. And there's, I mean, this terrible conflict that goes on. And yet God not only redeems and rescues that conflict, but he uses the conflict and his resolution of it in such a way as to save that whole family from starvation and famine. He protects them. He multiplies them in Egypt where they've relocated, where they're living. They're enslaved by the Egyptians, and yet God is faithful for 400 years. They're living as slaves, and then God selects Moses. This guy, this, this guy who is, who is an Israelite, who was raised in Pharaoh, the Egyptian king's household, but then had to flee for his life because of murdering an Egyptian. And, and, and then God finds him, and he says, you're going to be my people, you're going to tell them about me, sends Moses back, uses these incredible miracles, these, these amazing uh, plagues and disasters that he sends on Egypt because the Egyptians refused to set the Israelites free. And there are these awesome, powerful acts of darkness, of hail, of death of livestock, and even to the point of death of the firstborn child of every Egyptian, until finally the Egyptians say, enough is enough, God is stronger than we are, go, and then the people go and they walk out, and they get to a body of water, and they can't cross it, and the Egyptians say, what were we thinking, why did we let him go, let's go get him back, and so they take their chariots and they run off to get him and to bring him back into slavery, and God actually splits the water open, so there's a path of dry land in the middle of the water, and so the people walk through, and God in a pillar of cloud and fire stands between the Egyptians and the Israelites until the Israelites make it to the other side and then causes the waters to crash over and to drown the entire G Egyptian army and then he takes the people through the desert they don't have water to drink he causes water to burst out they don't have any food to eat he causes bread to come down from the sky six mornings a week he causes flocks of birds to come over so that they have meat to eat I mean all of these amazing things that God does and Moses is thinking about all of this stuff He's in the desert with them. You know, he's 90, 100, 110, 120 years old. At the end of his life, he's, he's thinking through of all that God has done for his people. And he's thinking, why in the world would our God do all of these incredible, miraculous deliverances for us only to kill each one of us off after 70 or 80 years? This does not make sense. 
Our God is so powerful. Our God is so great. He clearly loves us so much that He would do all these things for us. Why is there still death? And and so He has this instinct. There must be something more. He doesn't know what it is. But He asks for it. He says, God, do something. Do something about our plight. How long will it be? Look at us. Look at our situation, our mortality. Satisfy us, he says. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us happy for as long as we've been in trouble, which has been forever. Show us your pleasant side, he says. May the favor, may the pleasantness Verse 17, of the Lord our God rest upon us. You know, we're used to seeing the the, the dark side when we come to the end of our lives and we die. Show us the bright side. The bright side of your eternity and your eternal life. And it's at that point that he says, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Make our work permanent, lasting, meaningful. This is what we've been talking about, what I've been talking about for these last few weeks. Your work being meaningful. Establish it. Don't let it all get swallowed up in the ceaseless grind of change of entropy, of breaking down, of decay, of decomposition, of replacement by other things, of the sands of the desert sweeping over it and destroying it and turning it into a ruin. The house that you spent your whole life in, that you worked on, that you built up, that you remodeled, that you fixed, gets sold. And somebody changes it. Or it gets demolished, replaced. The business that you've worked your whole life merges after you retire or it goes under or 50 years from now 20 years from now it operates in a way you wouldn't even be able to recognize in the in the grind of all of this god established the work of our hands what moses was asking for even if he couldn't imagine it was for god to end death so god did so god ended death and here we're going to go to the second passage of Scripture that we're, I want you to look at, and that's in the book of Ephesians. That's in the New Testament. The book of Ephesians is a letter by Paul to the church at Ephesus, a city in what is today western Turkey. Its ruins are there. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Some of my very, very favorite verses in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, you can look in your table of contents to find it. We're just going to go verse by verse and see how God ended death. What He did to establish the work of our hands and to give us eternal life. First three verses of Ephesians chapter 2, we see the sorrow that Moses described. Paul, this Christian leader, writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. This is all the stuff that Moses was talking about, right? This is it. You're dead. You know, you, you, we were all dead in our transgressions and sins. And what that meant is two things. Number one, we're as good as dead. Because of the sins we've committed, we're as good as dead. We might be living now, but that's not going to last. We're going to die. But it also means that we are spiritually dead right now. We are inside dead. We're not alive. We're not alive to God. We're not alive where it counts. We're not alive where it matters. And it's because of ourselves, it's because of our transgressions and sins, it's because of our gratification of the cravings of our sinful nature, following its desires and thoughts, but it's also because of what the devil did. He's the one who's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. It's because of him too that we're in this situation, and it's because of God. We are, by nature, objects of wrath. Just being who we are, we cannot help but experience the wrath of God. But, God did something. Verses 4 and 5. But, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Can I get an amen? There we go. 
It is by grace you have been saved. I mean, it, because of His great love for us. A love that is not only greater than His wrath, but the wrath is really just the side of His love. Because it's a jealous love. It's a passionate love. It's a love that won't be denied. And because of that great love, God who is rich in mercy sent His Son, God the Son, to take on human form with the name Jesus. Jesus the Chosen One. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Anointed One. And that what He did is that He was the one of us who had no sin, who knew no sin, who did nothing wrong, but He died on a cross as if He had. And in doing that, He took all of our transgressions, all of our crimes, all of our twistedness and perversion, and all of our guilt, and it was heaped on Him as He died on that pole, tortured to death. So that when He died, our guilt died with Him. And He rose again to a new life. A new life that death has no mastery of, no power of, no control over. And so therefore, what He did by raising Him up from the dead, while we were dead in our transgressions and sins, God made us alive with Christ. He took people and made them alive so that they could have that same eternal life that Jesus Christ had when He rose from the dead on the third day. And they could come spiritually alive within. And so then, we, we have this this promise of satisfaction and joy that Moses talked about right now. It is, it is by grace you have been saved. Verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Because after He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God with all power and all authority, the name that is above every name. And we can be in Him, in Him even now with His glory and satisfaction and joy that He's experiencing right now. We are in Him and have a taste of it. Even as we're down here below, we're up there with Him right now. And how does this happen? How does this take place? It's not just for now, it's forever. Verse 7, that in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Because God is going to make an end to this age, to this era, to this history that we live in. It's going to come to a conclusion. It's going to cease. And there's going to be a new world without death. That's the age to come. The ages to come. This time that we've been living in, each of us has our own little you know, 70, 80, 90 year window in this period of time that's lasted a few thousand years is but an eye blink compared to the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of years of eternity. We cannot even fathom, we cannot conceive, and we have all of eternity for God to heap His glorious love and mercy and riches upon us. This is the thing that Moses was asking for times infinity. And how do you get this? Verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And my friends, this is the irony. The irony is that the way you get your work established is not by working. The way you get your work established is not by working. It's by faith. It's by faith. It's received as grace from God. And it's received, it's embraced by faith. Not by the works that you do. Not by trying harder. Not by working harder. Not by achieving more. Not by doing better. Not by improving every day. That's not how you get that. It's by faith. It's by saying, yes, thank you, Jesus. It's given by grace as a free gift. Not like the wage, not like the paycheck of death that comes from sin. But the beauty of it is that God saved us to establish our work. This is the kicker, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do see before he made this world this eternal god before you were born before humans were even made before the earth was made before the universe started god prepared then good things for you to do 
And he made you and recreated you who believe in Christ Jesus to do works that last. I don't know how they're going to last. I don't know what they're going to look like in the age to come. But they're going to last. He will confirm the work of your hands if you're in Christ Jesus. And this is the basis of all the hope that I've invited you to have over these past weeks. Because of Christ Jesus, your money becomes meaningful when you share it as a partner in the gospel. Because of Christ Jesus, your work to shape people for good is not for nothing. Because of Christ Jesus, you can't fail when you risk everything for Him. Because of Christ Jesus, you achieve when you love others and when you ask God to enable you to bear fruit that lasts. And because of Christ Jesus, you can expect a real reward when you work for your real boss. In other words, by Christ Jesus' work, God establishes your work. So accept Christ's work for you by faith with hope. Kelly's going to play a song 